examples. I think I'll just start by sharing this funny little story uh, that really should I turn this a bit for some of you see that. Um, like, like life and research and all of that, it's really full of these surprising encounters and which lead to surprising journeys. Uh, so uh, more than a year ago, I think it was in June, yeah, last year, uh, Hans wrote to me on Twitter, uh, having somehow stumbled upon some of my early work, it must have been, uh, in my PhD, and he wrote me and said, hey, we're writing about democratic playgrounds, and maybe there's something there, and then we've continued this conversation, and we had a meeting, and talking about, like, maybe places to meet, and you were trying for a long time to get here, uh, and we had a collaboration at the design school where I worked, also with people at Monash, and so things started slowly moving towards, oh, we might actually be in Australia at the same time, and the same core of Australia as well. Uh, so it's been a lot of coincidences and circumstances that led to the possibility for actually meeting here uh, now. So thank you for that, uh, Hans, for reaching out in the first place and sharing the article, which was surprising to me to find real democracy scholars doing work that was related to my project. Um, so that's just a little bit of the background. Why am I here? Um, and then, uh, I'll try to cover three different areas with my presentation here. Um, first, I'll try to talk a little bit of, well, it's essentially my background. I read somewhere that usually origin stories don't feature so prominently in academic work and in dissertations, but my kind of origin story has just really played a big role in why am I doing this kind of project. So I'll tell a little bit about that. And then I'll try to sort of get you a little bit up to speed on some of the current work that I've been doing in this intersection of play and democracy. And then the most important part, of course, at the end, uh, to try to explore where are some synergies, but also maybe where are there some interesting tensions uh, between the work that you're doing, a lot of different kinds of work, and then the work that I'm talking about here. So that's what I'm hoping for. Um, the way that I think about all of this, uh, I'm, I'm constantly moving between these three different domains with a lot of different concepts. So I, I'm maybe primarily rooted in play, play studies, play practice, but I've also been working at Design University for several years by now and doing design research. And then I'm super interested in the democratic aspect of that. Uh, but that's maybe where sort of I'm the least rooted, so I'm in a good place now, I guess, to sort of spa uh, around that. But what I'm thinking is sort of what happens when we push these different fields, domains, concepts together, like what emerges out of that? That's kind of my approach, this uh, way of bringing three different concepts together. And my hope for the presentation is not so much that I will give you definitive answers. This is the way it is. Uh, but more that that's an, an invitation to have ongoing conversations. So it's a really great opportunity to be able to give this presentation today. My first day at the center will be here for four or five weeks, and hopefully there will be time for conversations uh, after this based on some of the questions that will be raised today. So that's kind of my framing of this presentation. And then I go back a little bit. The title of the presentation today was, was what might we learn uh, about democracy and democratic participation um, from play. And it's inspired by this book that had a big uh, impact on me many years ago. An American, uh, I think he's a literary scholar, uh, doing discourse analysis. And then at some point, he became really interested in games. Uh, and, and my point of departure is in media studies. I used to work with games, serious games, game-based learning, all of that in the sort of the intersection of education and cultural institutions. And this book uh, was quite uh, important for me. What he was saying was that if, when we're looking at games and learning in education and in cultural institutions, it's not so much about just sort of pushing more games and more technology into the classrooms. It's about looking at the culture of games and the way people solve problems and work together around the games and with the games. Um, so he sort of uses the games to critique the way learning is being uh, teaching is being organized and structured. And this was kind of my approach when I was working in game-based learning. Uh, I was not so interested in the technology, but what happens around it and what, how can we learn from that? And, and maybe my 
proposition today is also a similar one, that, that if I'm talking about play and democracy, it's not about sort of forcing play into democratic institutions, but about looking at what can we learn about ways of structuring participation, uh, ways of organizing, ways of creating invitations to participate in democratic processes more than sort of now it all needs to be played. So uh, I think that is kind of my way of thinking about this. There might be some contributions there, even if it's not about sort of pushing the playgrounds into the parliaments everywhere in the world. So uh, staying a little bit back in time, I, I told you that my sort of origin story is important for my project, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. At this point in time, I was self-employed. Um, I was so for 10 years or so after I finished media studies. Uh, I was working with games and learning, but I saw it was more interesting to look at the playful encounters that happened around the games. And I became really interested in play and playfulness as an attitude, as a way to approach each other. So I founded this uh, play festival, which was a thing I had learned to do to sort of create grassroots events to bring people together across different disciplines. And I felt like there's a need in the study of play uh, to bridge academic conferences, which was often not very playful, but still sort of trying to understand play. And then play festivals that was already happening, that was like just playing, so to speak, get together and play and try different games. I wanted to create something in the middle that was kind of reflected as an academic conference, uh, engaging with the research, but also engaging with the playful encounters. So I created this festival. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just wanted to create place that could really take place seriously in its own right and try to study it together. Uh, so I, I started it and people, surprisingly enough, came and got really engaged in this, wanted to be part of shaping it. We've done it 2014, 15, 16, 17. Then we needed a bit of a break, so we started doing it every other year, then 19, and then, you know, things have been happening these past few years. And now I've come here and, and some of uh, my friends in Melbourne start talking about maybe doing it in, in Melbourne next year. So maybe that's the plan. I don't quite know, but we did it uh, a number of years and it was very community driven. Like it was 150, 200 people coming to Denmark uh, for the five years that's taken place in the main public library in Aarhus in Denmark. So it's also been this exploration of public space and what can we do in the library. Um, People coming, people really getting a sense of ownership, starting to develop this, both the event itself, which is three days, uh, but also the community around it. Uh, it's very much been something that we do together. Uh, just as an example, it's this event that offers all kinds of different ways of exploring play across learning, working and living. Those are our three main tracks or pillars. Uh, and then one of the things that I really like about it is that people come, they present their work. Sometimes it's academic work, sometimes it's practice work. Uh, then they invite people to play with whatever they have brought. And then quite often it goes in a different direction because that's quite often what happens when you really get into play. You sort of just follow the energy. Uh, and this, I think it was actually a musical workshop, someone working with like musical kinds of playing, uh, playful approaches to music. So they were playing music and then it just escalated like uh, and then it was suddenly rope skipping like and this is in the middle of the big lecture room in the library. But, so even that is sort of pushing, OK, what can take place in the library here? And then it's a talk of war suddenly because there wasn't rope anyway, so why not? And um, so just as an example of what I'm interested in is these encounters where people feel playful and really get into play, get into that atmosphere. And they risk themselves a little bit because it becomes very personal, like they're not really hiding who they are. And then it evolves because they have this sense of agency and ownership. They can actually do things with this event, shape it in a different kind of manner, which is what they do here. And I have so many examples of this, like they, they take over the whole thing. Um, and, and then I try, started to try to understand what's, what's going on in this space, uh, where adults come to a library in Denmark to understand play and to play. Uh, just a few of the perspectives that people bring this is really quite touching to me. Uh, this participant here just talks about how it has breathed new life into her. 
uh, she really feels invigorated after being there. Another one talks about he's looking for these spaces where he can just be, uh, where he doesn't have to perform, where he doesn't have to be someone else, where he can, yeah, be with other people and just play. Um, and in a way, it's fairly simple, but I'm also quite touched by people coming to this event as professionals. Typically, people come because they want to bring play into their work life. But then they end up talking about who they really are as people and feeling safe enough to show that person and that side of themselves. So these sort of reactions from people got me thinking that ah, what's going on here? Uh, one perspective of this is from a friend of mine who's a professor uh, in Denmark at the design school where I work. She became a friend because of the festival and she's uh, researching play. And what she says is that taking play seriously is to try to take seriously the meaning making that happens. You can't stand on the outside and look at it and say, this is silly, we might be, but, but it's actually meaningful, it's actually about making meaning together, but also that people tell a lot about who they are when they actually get into play together, where they sort of let go of the barriers and the facades and the adult expectations and the what will my boss say and all of that, and it just sort of, it's just you with a group of other people who are super ambitious and serious but they're also just letting go. Um, so they will say who they are, they will explore what it means to be human, they will ask all kinds of questions. And over time, the festival evolved into a safe space for questioning all these assumptions about what does it mean to be an adult? What does it mean to go to work? Who owns public space? What can we do in public space? Who defines what is allowed in public space? What are, like, how can we change the way we organize the workplace and all kinds of questions. And like, there's this phrase I like from a science scholar, Thomas Bent, that talked about encountering the possible. And that's really what it felt like. Like this was really encountering the possible here in this weird, silly space that also became, became very personal and very sort of deeply rooted in people's lives. Um, so it became the space where things could, could happen. And one uh, place scholar, I'm just trying to sort of also say a little bit about sort of some of the theory that I was inspired by early on. It's not that you necessarily need to read it, but there's this American sociologist and play scholar, Thomas S. Henriks, who talks about play as a laboratory, play as a laboratory for living together. And when we play together, is what he say. I'm really, I was really struck quite early on by this uh, statement that we create worlds and when we play together, we effectively create models for living. It's like, okay, so we're negotiating ways of being together, ways of living together, ways of organizing, so we can maybe be together, live together with, with each other in better ways, more meaningful ways. Um, and reading all of this and hearing the comments from the people coming, I was like, okay, what, what's really going on here? Like, does this have anything to do with democracy? Was one of my initial questions and one of the questions that I asked a lot of times, maybe you can see in the URL here, one of the first blog posts I just sort of wrote trying to figure out thoughts was, can play save democracy? And of course, the answer is no, but uh, it, might, it might inspire us or inform some different modes of participation. Um, so this was just up to the point where I was reflecting on what is the, the relationship here? And I was just asking all these questions and maybe if we have a space like this and an atmosphere like this, and you can't really see, but it's right at the beginning of the festival and, and there are all these chairs, 200 chairs, and all the people in the room are sitting on the chairs and then suddenly in comes this South African performance artist and have everybody crawl all over the chairs and the room is completely transformed. Um, so a space like that and an atmosphere like that where that could happen, maybe it could contribute to some kind of reinvigoration of our more local, informal, democratic conversations and encounters. So I was not aiming at institutions, parliaments and all of that, but the whole aspect of democracy that sort of lives between us. And um, maybe there was something there. And, and maybe if we could expand our sort of participatory repertoire, maybe we could also invite more people in, some of the people who would not go to the town hall meeting or the mini publics or whatever uh, important initiatives are going on, maybe they would want to be a part of this. And then maybe we could also expand our imaginary because 
that was really one of the things I saw. People could imagine so many different things suddenly, things they would normally take for granted. But in this case, with their bodies and whatever this person is doing here, uh, there, there are a lot of different sort of impulses for imagining. Impulses that moves outside also of rational thinking and outside of our heads. So that was uh, me going towards what then became the PhD project. So that's kind of a lot of background, but it captures a lot of what I find important. I think I'll skip these. They were just some of the early sort of theoretical stuff that I started reading to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, a lot of it is about, yeah, the living of democracy in everyday life, uh, Nussbaum about sort of seeing the other. Uh, I was quite inspired also by Delaporte's Work on participation, also thanks to Camilla, some of the work relates to that. Um, and this, this notion that post-democracy, uh, where is actually the space for it, for challenging uh, the way things are done, if it's already decided due to financial logics or whatever. So these were just some of my initial trying to figure out, find my bearings in this space. Uh, and then after a lot of detours, I ended up with my PhD project at Design School Culling at Chinese Design University. And I tried to find uh, a metaphor, a framing for my project that could, on the one hand, be rather inclusive and, and have a fairly diverse, uh, allow a diverse range of forms of play to, to be there. So it couldn't just be one, you have to play like this, it wouldn't make sense. On the other hand, I had to narrow it down from the festival, which was about all kinds of play in the world. So I went back to this Danish, old Danish tradition of Skamalai, uh, of junk playgrounds, junkyard playgrounds, that also inspired the adventure playground movement uh, later on, that uh, was suggested by a Danish architect in 1931. Um, and I was like, okay, but maybe my project is to propose the, the junk playground, the junkyard playground as a kind of agora. A different kind of agora that shifts focus at least a bit from rational thinking, rational discourse towards the body and materials and imagining and playing in different kinds of ways. So that's essentially my project and the project that sort of Hans saw an overlap in terms of the notion of democratic playgrounds. And then I'll say a little bit about that and, and how that unfolds because. As I'm at a design school, as, and as I have this background as a self-employed, grassroots kind of uh, person who does things and makes things and brings people together, um, I knew, of course, that I would be doing experiments and I would be doing experimental field work. And in design research, the design experiment is quite so common as the approach to field work. Um, so I, I work in this tradition of, of constructive design research, and we make these experiments not to prove something, but to allow something to emerge. It's really open-ended. And I feel very much at home in that, even though it also becomes super messy. So it's very messy. And that's also why I said in the beginning, no definitive answers, because <laughs> I might not even have that, have that when I'm done. But what I proposed was a space for playful, open-ended material inquiry, like we have all these discarded materials and they're there, we use them to build uh, our argument, to tell stories and just to explore. Um, and, and my experiments have always been sort of centered around matters of mutual concern, like this broad, like is it a question? Is it a community who wants to explore a site? Uh, is it a question about how an organization develops in the future? Things that could sort of be considered avenues towards democratic participation. And then, uh, then we use the materials to explore that and to tell those stories. I'll just show a couple of examples. This was one of my very first experiments. It was an entire school, like maybe a hundred people, all adults, the staff, uh, and and they wanted to do different things. But they wanted to explore how could first how could they develop the school. So it was kind of a future strategy kind of thing for them. But they also wanted to explore. How could they risk? Uh, how could they risk more? How could they let go more? How could they? They said in Danish, like, how could they learn to move on to thin ice when they're making decisions? So they're making school. Uh, 
and and they would rather involve the students more. They would rather move a little bit away from the very sort of strict way of controlling the, the processes. And I, I just thought, sort of, okay, they're going to get that. So. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to read it. So this is just right at the beginning. We're saying, okay, I, in this experiment, I told them this story inspired by the science fiction, like you're in the future. You don't know what's going on. All you know, all you have are these, this pile of materials, all this pile of materials, so all things that someone else threw out for whatever reason. And those materials will hold the future of your school. So it was just to sort of get them imagine in a different kind of way what might the future look like for them and to get their conversations around what they wanted the school to look like in the future to give them a different point of departure. So at this point, they're just exploring all these materials and trying to figure out and some of them feel really uncomfortable because it's very open ended. It's very messy. It's very sort of chaotic. Um, and then they, they get into it and they stay, I would say, really just try to hit the mute button down here so I can talk over it. But but this group, they used this space, the junkyard as a gora, as a way to explore the future of the school and also to deal with some of the topics they find really difficult. So this group has actually been exploring how to engage with so-called vulnerable students, like students who need some kind of help to, and, and they're doing it in a, in a satirical kind of manner. They're wrapping this person in bubble wrap and really making it very safe. Uh, but the conversations they're having is actually around, like, how can we actually do this? How do we work with this in a way that's not overprotective, but still allowing them to be part of the organization? And another uh, example, I'll just have a, a couple more. Um, this was a group of students at a higher education, and they're working with sort of, I think they always say like they educate bureaucrats. So they're sort of, they're not uh, social science, they're not political science. It's a, uh, it's called, it's a bachelor. Like it's a bachelor, but more sort of practice oriented. But they're working with the welfare systems and they're working in welfare systems in Denmark. So they're really interested in the design of how do we create the organizations, the sort of the public institutions that face the citizens. Uh, and, and they were, the question was, how can we make those institutions more inclusive um, in the future? And this quote is not so much about that, but it's just one of these students who had a, normally had a really hard time getting into collaboration, working with the other, finding her own voice, being able to actually sort of come up with ideas and present them in the group. And what she talked about here, especially the last bit there, um, is, is this feeling of letting go a little bit, uh, letting go of control and just being in that collaboration and then figuring out, okay, this is actually, like now I'm on a journey towards who I want to be, what I want my, my voice to be, how I want to participate in these questions. Um, and I find that quite quite moving also because this experiment compared to the other one with all the teachers, this was very quiet and introspective. Uh, and I'm, I guess it's sometimes a little bit harder to see what's going on uh, during the processes. But then these reflections afterwards showed me that so much was happening. And then the, the last example I'll mention here is a colleague of mine uh, who uh, is living in this small town in Denmark, and they had this gravel pit. It was just sort of a com communal area. It was an old gravel pit, and it was not really used, but it was in the middle of a neighborhood, like houses all around. Um, and then at some point, they got some money from the municipality to sort of develop this place into a, a public space that everyone could use. And the municipality said, we'll do that together with the neighborhood, and they have this local group that's part of developing the area. But then suddenly the municipality gave a lot of the money to an architectural company and they had already started developing what's going to happen down there. And, you know, they made the drawings and all of that. Uh, maybe even they got to the renderings. Um, and then someone said, well, what about the people living there? Like, how are we going to be a part of this conversation? And then we tried to do these junk, junkyard playgrounds in the gravel pit to explore the site by playing inside and by building whatever adults and children would like to see there. And this is some of the data that I'm also currently looking at and trying to, to see also uh, in, a, in the context of urban planning. We're writing an article about that currently. 
how does this propose a different way of participating in urban planning processes? And how does it also develop a sense of ownership over the space? Um, sometimes in contrast to what the municipality would like to, to happen. So that's uh, some of the experiments. And when I look at this, and also when I look at Counterplay, the festival that I did earlier, there are at least some central themes that sort of, maybe it's not democratic as such, but I think it relates to understanding ways of participating. Um, one thing that I see quite clear, both in the festival and in these experiments, is that it fosters a sense of agency and also courage. Like a lot of people, including the woman, the phrase that I have brought, feel like confused, frustrated, what, I'm, what am I doing in this sort of chaotic experiment? But they find a way and they find their courage to act and to speak up and to bring their opinions uh, and to also develop new ideas together in the groups. So that's the first thing I'm really interested in, these sort of different notions of participation and how it becomes possible. And then maybe also because I'm in a design uh, university, I'm very interested in the materials, the, the discarded materials that you could just consider them building materials, but you could also consider them sort of part of the playful experience because they provide a kind of friction. Maybe also because they're dirty and broken and messy and they're not, they're not new and nice, so they don't tell you what to do. They kind of push back. We talk a lot about that, how the, the materials push back and push us in new directions, uh, showing other possibilities. I see that when I'm looking at the, the GoPro footage of the people moving and picking up things that it actually pushes them, that they find things that surprise them. And then one thing that's really prominent in all of these is that it encourages questioning. Uh, it, they question rules, like the rules of the activity, the purpose of the activity, they question their role in that activity. They question the space itself. They question the materials. They question all kinds of things, much more than they answer anything. So I also, when I read your article, Hansen, about sort of the democratic solutionism of this approach that we need solutions. This is not so much what it does. Uh, it doesn't really provide us with the answer of the solutions, but it opens up a lot of questions and ways of thinking about um, the way we organize and live together. And it certainly also pushes the imagination and the will to experiment. Uh, I always say that when we play together in space, we have already made a change to the world. Like the world is already a little bit different because we approach differently for that period of time. And that will stay with us. I can't say for how long, but you know, you already have a different perspective of things as soon as you have been in a space where you could make another world possible. And it's not just sort of uh, theoretically possible, it's been enacted. So you actually did it, you made it happen. Uh, and, and the last thing that I'll mention here is maybe my my biggest interest, like it's hard to say, but this is really a thing that I've been super interested in over the years, bringing people together, cultivating communities, assembling in we. That's a phrase that I took from a scholar I met in, in Melbourne just recently, Stacey Goldman Jones, who talks about research as assembling in we. We're not, she uses autoethnography, and she talks a lot about, we're not writing about us when we're writing also enough if we're trying to bring people in to better understand, to lower the sort of the uh, defenses or like allow people to be more vulnerable in our research, uh, essentially to, to cultivate a community and assemble a we. And I see this happening in the experiments, like people come together in all kinds of ways. But I also start to see this in my project as a whole, like some of the stories that I have to share invite people in to have conversations that I never thought about, like being here, for instance, there's some sort of assembling and we going on in the project itself. So that's my main thing there. And then there's this one thing that I just can't sort of leave. Uh, you probably know Sisi Pauchirizi, uh, who earlier this year wrote this book about uh, democracy. And, and she keeps asking through the book, but it's a joyful. She talks about different modes of, modes of participation. She keeps asking. A rhetorical question, but is it joyful? And she suggests that, of course, other uh, ways of participating are possible. Some that are joyful, playful, and more meaningful. Uh, and and that's really one thing that I've seen. That and yeah, it is actually quite joyful. It's also conflicted, and there's a lot of agonism at times. But but at the heart, it's also just driven by a joyful mode of engagement with each other, which I can't really shake. That 
there's something there. Yeah, and, and now I'm also just connecting to, to some of the research that might also be interesting to say that in design research, of course, there's been a long tradition of co-design and participatory design, trying to especially work with democracy in the workplace, but it's been broadened quite a lot. And then earlier this year, uh, this American design scholar, Carl Sal, wrote this book, uh, which also resonates quite a lot. He doesn't talk about sort of revolutionizing, but maintaining uh, like it's democratic maintenance for him that we do um, and makes it possible to, yeah, this constant renewal more than sort of overthrowing and changing everything uh, and making them more vibrant. So that's another sort of little piece of work that fits quite well and pushes my thinking. Um, and then I think the last slide essentially here is just a few connecting to some of the articles that I've read by some of you, uh, and it's of course my not my knowledge is limited, but uh, I think I'm starting with you, Hans. But actually, in a way, anyway, I'll come to that. And so, of course, in, in this article that you uh, wrote with Frederick, um, you point to the genetic potential, which is clearly something that I also see in my own work. Uh, that that's really a way of inviting people in so they actually feel like they can do things because they do things. That is like they are doing and acting the, the world that they want to see. Um, and, and this is also speaking a little bit also from the article, speaking a little bit about maybe we also need something else than the output orientation. Maybe we also need something about the answers. Uh, we need something, we need spaces that are more open-ended. Uh, more spaces for the imagination. In, in the design research, we talk a lot about the fuzzy front end, the part of design where we don't know what's going on. Uh, and maybe there's a fuzzy front end of democratic participation in a way where we don't quite know yet. Maybe that's before the formal deliberation and the referenda and all of that. That might be one way to sort of situate it. But I think actually this uh, article uh, by you, you Nicole, um, also was one of the, I read that a while ago, and, and one of the articles that really got me thinking about, oh yeah, actually real democracy scholars are talking about these matters as well, this suggestion that the creative, playful, emotional, uh, sometimes cannibalesque, and I certainly have some of the cannibalesque uh, forms of claim making can uh, deepen democratic discourse. And then you point to uh, Toby Rollo, which I then coincidentally also got in touch with on Twitter. So, uh, there's a lot of conversations going on. And then, uh, so it's not to sort of tell, tell you about your own work, but just to <laughs> sort of try to show some openings where I see like, oh, there's a lot to talk about, essentially, actually. Uh, the most recent one I uh, read was this one that I also just mentioned to you, so, uh, where deliberation is more than words and how nonverbal communication really adds also effective qualities. Another place where I might bring in Camilla again, because she knows a lot more about epic theory than I do. Um, but it's just to see that reading these articles and then coming here is super exciting because on the one hand, I feel like I shouldn't say anything about democracy. And on the other hand, there are at least some openings and connections and some sort of shared interests uh, to talk about. And I think that's where I'll, I'll just stop. Like there are all these connections, all the synergies, and then of course, hopefully also some, some tensions like it disappears a little bit, but the one down there is just the, the criteria you have having that article for deliberation, which to say at least some of what's going on in my experiments does not live up to these uh, criteria, but still there might be something there that's interesting to look into. Yeah, so I think that's one of the things that I've been trying to come to terms with uh, <laughs> over the past two years is that maybe my project is not about deliberation or even democracy per se, and maybe that's okay. Uh, for the project, it'll be, it won't be a problem. It's mostly about me personally trying to sort of figure out where am I in this. But if it can teach us anything or inspire us to think about participation and deliberation, then that's one of them. And then maybe I don't have to hope for a lot more. So I think that's.